Thank you, Manuela, for inviting me here. Thank you for being here. Uh, so very briefly, after my uh, master in pharmaceutical sciences in uh, Modena, I got a PhD funded by the European Community uh, that I, uh, in neurobiology, and I spent part of my PhD in Quebec. Then I went back to Quebec for a postdoc, where I started to work on molecular chaperones and protein quality control, which is now the leading uh, uh, topic of my research. And uh, I made a second postdoc uh, in the University Medical Center Groningen in the Netherlands. And after that, uh, uh, I came back to Italy with the Vitali Montalcini program. And uh, I'm now associate professor since 2015 in Modena. So, uh, my background is really protein quality control and our cells deals with protein misfolding and how this is involved in several neurodegenerative diseases. But in the last year, we came across to uh, this new uh, way of looking at cell uh, uh, compartmentalization, which is phase transition. And I will try to uh, show you how these two things may be connected. So, uh, we know that eukaryotic cells are highly compartmentalized, and they contain both membrane mount and membrane less compartments. And in this cartoon here, we only see membrane less compartments. We have, for example, stress granules that are induced upon stress in the cytoplasm, RNA transport granules in the cytoplasm, and then many of these membrane compartments are present in the, in the nucleus, like the nucleolus itself, and several bodies like PML bodies, nuclear speckles, cahal bodies. So we know that these compartments exist since a very long time, but the way they compartmentalize and they exist not being uh, 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 um, separated by membranes uh, has been uh, discovered only lately by the group of Tony Eyman and other co-workers. And actually what they find is that uh, the compartmentalization of these condensates occurs by a process that is called liquid-liquid phase separation, where the specific proteins reach, uh, uh, when they reach a critical concentration, they exit uh, from the homogeneous solution and they self-assemble to form what is called a membraneless uh, or an organelle or a, a condensate. And the formation of this condensate is regulated by several factors like ionic strength, temperature, and post translational modification. And generally, within these compartments, the proteins are highly mobile, and these compartments themselves are often very dynamic. So they can form, they change in composition in response to stress, and they can dissolve after the formation. So there are typically three main functions that have been attributed to these membranous compartments, which are, first, they act as a, react a reaction crucible because they can concentrate in a specific compartment, specific molecules, and thereby facilitating a specific biochemical reaction. Or they can shut down specific uh, uh, signaling pathways uh, especially in response to stress, because they can sequester within specific compartments uh, signaling molecules. And we will see uh, later on one example, which are the stress granules, which can sequester um, both mTOR and uh, molecule astrin, and by doing so, they participate to the shutdown of metabolism and also to uh, the inhibition of ap apoptosis during uh, the acute stress response. So sequestration of uh, key signaling complexes to uh, regulate uh, cell response to stress. And then, uh, especially uh, for the compartments that form in the nucleus, they are considered as organizational hub because they can uh, regulate the rearrangement of the chromatin and of, uh, they can concentrate a large variety of uh, uh, enzymes and therefore regulate <coughs> complex uh, uh, processes like, for example, gene expression. And lately, there were very nice um, work showing that the super enhancer formed by phase separation and thereby regulate uh, transcription in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the gene, in the, in the, in the nucleus. So how do uh, these complex uh, form? So liquid-liquid phase, phase separation is generally thought to be driven by either the interaction, weak interaction between proteins that have multi-domain, so multivalent protein, and here we have the example of a protein that has an H SH2 and SH3 domain, or another example is, for example, represented by PML, that self-assembles into PML bodies, and in this case, the fact that PML is itself sumoylated and it has sumo interacting motif, is really at the basis of its self assembly into this membranous condensate, which is called PML nuclear body, and we will see this later. 
But in other cases, it is uh, the presence of proteins that have a particular structure. They are called the disordered proteins. They uh, have a higher aggregation propensity, and these disordered proteins can self-assemble and often they interact with nucleic acid, driving the formation of these membranous compartments. So what are these intrinsically disordered domains? Uh, they are also called low-complexity domain or prion-like domain because they are uh, enriched for polar amino acid and they are generally characterized by uh, lower stability. And they are generally what we consider not folded, not well-folded domains that are present in proteins. And actually, the intrinsic disorder is required to maintain the physical properties of membranous organisms. However, this comes with a cost because the intrinsic disorder makes this protein really uh, vulnerable to misfolding and aggregation. And therefore, these membranous organelles that form in size in response to a variety of stimuli, uh, they are highly unstable and they can convert uh, from uh, a liquid-like state where the molecules are highly mobile and highly dynamic and where the assembly is reversible. So these molecules can undergo phase separation from this compartment, but then they also can exit this phase separated compartment which will dissolve. But this liquid compartment can, due to the intrinsic stability of these disordered proteins, mature into a glassy solid or hydrogel state which is still reversible, but this can then mature into what is considered to be an irreversible arrested state and that uh, has the characteristic uh, structure of um, amyloid fibers. So, uh, and uh, this has been really well demonstrated by biochemical studies that have been performed in several labs, and here I'm showing data from Tony Eyman and Simon Alberti in Dresden, but similar data were obtained in the lab of Paul Taylor and Stephen McKnight, and uh, uh, different proteins that have intrinsically disordered domains. This is the case, what we are looking at here is FOS, but similar data have been obtained with TIA1, HMP1, and other RNA binding proteins. They typically behave in this way. So they can exit upon a certain condition, upon a critical concentration, the solution, and form these liquid like droplets that mature into hydrogel, and this hydrogel can mature into this fibrillar like state. So we know that the conversion of normal and soluble polypeptides into an amyloid-like state has been associated with more than 50 the different diseases in humans, and I'm citing the most famous one, the Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and also inclusion body myopathy. And these amyloid deposits contain these other proteins, such as TDP43, FOS, HRNPN1, and TIA1, those that contain this intrinsically disordered domain, which are essential for their physical function, but they render these proteins more aggregation prone, so more vulnerable to misfolding. What Genetic and biochemical evidence from different labs has demonstrated in the last decade is that there are mutations in these uh, disordered proteins that have been linked to familiar forms of ALS, uh, frontotemporal dementia, inclusion body biopathies. And uh, from a biochemical point of view, these mutations all accelerate the transition of this protein from a liquid like state into an aggregated amyloid like state. So indicating that most likely this aberrant transition is part of, uh, may part, be part of the pathogenic mechanism contributing to disease progression. Of course, since the accumulation of aggregated prone proteins is toxic for, for the cells, cells have evolved a very sophisticated protein quality control system that detects a protein misfolding and that tar tries to either refold the proteins or target them to degradation. So here it's a very simplified cartoon. We have at the first level the molecular chaperones. Most of them are heat of proteins, but not only. And what they do is that they recognize um, proteins that are not folded uh, correctly. They recognize hydrophob hydrophobic patches that are exposed by non-native uh, proteins, and they try to bi they bind to these patches and they assist the folding of these unfolded proteins into their native state. When the unfolding the protein cannot achieve its native state and misfold, 
it can aggregate. And then Chapron target these unfolded proteins or disaggregated proteins to the different degradation system that we have in the cells, the proteasome system, the chaperone mediated autophagy, and the macrotophagy to clear them. And this they do by cooperating with other cofactors. So it's really a sophisticated and complex system. And one of the key chaperones that is doing so in the cell, in mammalian cells, is the HSP70 system. But then we have adapters, proteins that target ubiquitinated proteins to the macrotophagic pathway, for example. So considering that, a large fraction of our proteome is metastable, which means that these proteins exist at uh, concentrations that are very close to their insolubility, and that this promotes, on the one side, their aggregation, on the other side, their compartmentalization in membranes organized. Considering that errors occur constantly during translation, leading to the production of what we call defective ribosomal products, which are aggregation from products defective that need to be cleared by the protein quality control system and that challenge proteostasis, so the maintenance of the protein. And considering that, we have seen that this intrinsic disorder, which is essential for the functionality of a sub subset of proteins, make them vulnerable to irreversible aggregation, we asked whether the protein quality control indirectly maintain the functionality of these membranous compartment, which are unstable, intrinsically unstable, and that failure of the protein quality control on the other side and aberrant phase transition may concur to protein aggregation, cell dysfunction, and disease. So these are the key questions we were working in the last years, and all what I showed you are just the premises that allowed us to formulate this question. And actually, I think that amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and frontotemporal dementia represent the best example to address this question because it is where we think the protein quality control and membranous organelle dynamics and maintenance meet. So from the genetic point of view, there are two main fun functional families of genes that are linked to ALS. One functional family encodes for protein quality control factors, and here we have the gene encoding for BCP, which is a chaperone that targets misfolded protein 2 degradation both by the proteasome and the microtophagy pathway. We have mutations in P62, which is an autophagy adapter that uh, has a binding domain for ubiquitinated proteins to target them to the macrotophagy pathway. And then we have ubiquitin 2, which is also another autophagy adapter, and other accessory proteins that regulate autophagy-mediated degradation. On the other side, we have a second important family of genes involved in ALS, which are genes encoding for RNA-binding protein. And uh, these proteins regulate the metabolism, so the, 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 the translation, the splicing, different aspects of the RNA life cycle. And examples are TDP43, FAST, TL1, HRNPA1, metrin 3 And I told you that all these proteins contain this intrinsically disordered domain that make them prone to aggregation, and those are the domains required for their recruitment of self-assembly into these uh, membranous organs. So normally, these proteins are recruited together with the mRNA in polysome, and they can regulate translation. Upon stress condition, polysome disassemble, and uh, the messenger RNAs are released along with the RNA binding protein, early initiation factor of translation, and the 40 subunits of the ribosome, which are all recruited inside this membranous compartment that is called the stress granule, so an RNP, RNA protein complex. Stress granules so form very rapidly upon different types of stress conditions, viral infection, oxidative stress, temperature upshift. They form by phase separation, when polysome disassemble, and they are highly dynamic. And generally, they rapidly dissolve upon stress relief. So if one wants to visualize stress glands in the cells, so uh, here we'll just show you very quickly two movies. Uh, those are typical experiments that we do in our lab. So 
we have HeLa cells stably expressing G3BP with the GFP tag. This is one of the key proteins that is required for stress gonadal formation. And then you will see that when we apply the stress, the stress gonads will form very rapidly. And then in this cartoon here, we just will see that after the stress, when we remove, uh, in this case, it's sodium arsenide, you either recover with phase, then the stress gonads will very rapidly um, disappear. So here you see they form. They form within minutes. It's very rapid and they dissolve within 10, 20, 30 minutes when uh, we remove the stress. So this is the typical behavior of stress gonads in normal healthy cells. However, data from different labs showed in the last year that in ALS cell models, the stress gonads persist for longer time. So there is something wrong going on here at the level of the disassembly. So, Considering that many of the RNA binding proteins that are recruited inside these trosgonals contain, contain these intrinsically disordered domains, and their intrinsic property is to mature into an aggregated state. And considering that all the ALS patient mutations accelerate this transition, we really thought. Uh, is there something going wrong at the level of stress gunners? And are these stress gunners that convert into an aggregated like state really an important part of the uh, pathogenesis? So one of the typical features of ALS, like many other neurodegenerative disorders, is the accumulation of these amyloid-like aggregates. They are mostly found in the cytoplasm, but we can find some of them also in the nucleus. And these aggregates contain, as I told you, stress granule proteins. They contain TDP43 in the truncated and phosphorylated form. They contain FAS. They contain several stress granule markers. But they also contain a number of misfolded substrate and polyubiquitinated substrate, misfolded SON1, which are generally recognized by the protein quality control system. So I showed you BCP and P62 which target this misfolded protein to degradation. And I showed you that mutations in these two particular genes are linked to ALS. So we thought, could it be that uh, stress granules evolve into pathological aggregates and that failure at the level of the protein quality control may concur with the intrinsic aggregation propensity of this protein to the formation of these aggregates and, of course, to the toxicity that these aggregates uh, are, are, are linked uh, with. And therefore, we ask these two genetic pathways, can they converge and influence each other? And I, I chose this cartoon because uh, I told you that the membranous compartments are liquid-like, and we think like there is a kind of dense phase of misfolded protein that may poison these liquid-like phase of stress gunners due to impairment of the protein body control. So this was really the question we were working on. So what is the cause of the conversion of physiological stress gunners into an aggregated state? So I told you that the formation of stress gunners occur upon stress and when polysome disassemble. So for a person that works on the protein quality control more than on the RNA side, Polysome disassembly means that all the proteins that are in the process of being synthesized will be released in form of truncated proteins because their synthesis will not be finished. And therefore, they are released as defective ribosomal products or GIPs. These proteins, due to the lack of few or many more amino acids, will never be able to achieve their native state, and therefore, they are recognized by the protein quality control system and targeted to degradation by proteasome and autophagy. Considering that the formation of these stress gonads occur by liquid-liquid phase separation very rapidly and the molecular crowding of the cells, and considering the fact that many of these proteins are metastable per se, their concentration is already on the verge of aggregation, we thought, could it be that the drips that are all in a sudden released by the polysome that disassemble co-aggregate with stress granules? And could it be that actually the chaperones prevent the co-aggregation of the drips with the stress granules, maintaining the liquid-like behavior of these uh, membranous organs? And uh, in general, another thing that I want to stress is that it is thought that there are eight ribosomes scanning one messenger RNA. So per molecule of mRNA, we can have, in theory, up to eight molecules of drips released, which is a lot. 
So to address that question, we did a few very simple experiments. So here, what we do is we induce transgonus with the MG132, which is an inhibitor of the proteasome that has been previously published to induce transgonal formation. It's also blocking the proteasome, so it's increasing the level of drips. So this is the perfect condition for us to test our model. And then we let the cells to recover after the stressful run of formation is maximal, either in drug-free medium or in a medium that contains a drug called VER, which is an inhibitor of the ATPase activity of HSP70, one of the key chaperones in the cell. And then we ask, is the disassembly of Strasganus impaired by inhibition of this HSP70 chaperone? And actually, yes, you can really see that just by inhibiting one single chaperone, HSP70, you have a strong delay in the disassembly kinetic of Strasganus. And similar data have been obtained by depletion of another subset of chaperones, which are HSPV8 and BAC3, that form a complex together with HSP70 that has been shown by my, myself and other labs uh, to target misfolded protein to degradation by autophagy. So this means that several, there are several chaperones that if you block them, they have a negative consequence on the disassembly of stress So how is this occurring at the mechanistic level? Is this due to the drips? So to address that question, we artificially induce the formation of drips using an analog of puromycin, which is called opipuro. It is recognized by the cell as an analog of tRNA, so it is inserted into the protein instead of an amino acid, and once inserted, the puromycin leads to the disassembly of the polysome and to the release of the truncated defective ribosomal product. It can be visualized then by click chemistry like we did here. So we ask the question, are drips coaggregating the stress And actually, we find that in control condition, the stress in green do not generally contain drips. Drips can aggregate elsewhere in the cytoplasm, which has already been known. But when we induce the formation of stress in cells where we block the activity of this HSP70 chaperon, then we see that there is a perfect colocalization between drips and stress is this really responsible for the delayed disassembly? So we then perform several experiments and we look at the percentage of stress that persist for a longer time during the recovery phase, and those stress contain higher amount of defective ribosomal product, which is quantified here. So the stress that persist for a longer time are the ones that are enriched for drips. Moreover, we did also kind of biochemical analysis and these stress convert into a state that is less uh, uh, sensitive to digestion with RNAs A. I will come back to this in a couple of minutes. So on the basis of several data, and I'm just showing you the, the, the main one, uh, we could identify that uh, upon stress, a fraction of stress gunners can accumulate these defective ribosomal products. And when drips accumulate inside stress gunners, they convert into an aberrant state that is characterized by a lower dynamic behavior. And uh, uh, we also find that the stress gunners that accumulate misfolded proteins recruit molecular chaperones. So one of the chaperones I told you that is also involved in the regulation of the dynamic of stress gunners is this HSPV8. And here we could see that stress gunners that recruit increasingly amount of a misfolded protein, which is UBC90S, that we use as a model misfolded protein, also recruit increasing amount of this molecular chaperone HSPV8. And other chaperones, such as BAC3 and HSPV1, they are also recruiting. So the idea is that the chaperones recruit, cha the, sorry, the stress gunners recruit increasingly amount of stress gunners to avoid irreversible aggregation of misfolded proteins, such as TRIPS, together with RNA uh, binding protein. So then we found out also that, of course, uh, normally protein quality control system, and in particular the HSPV8 by 3 HSP70 complex, but also BCP, avoid the accumulation of drips inside stress gunners by targeting them to degradation. This maintains the liquid-like properties of stress gunners that form and then disassemble. So we refer to this protein quality control system as to granulostasis. And actually, so this data allowed us to define two populations of stress gunners that form in cells. The first population 
is what we call physiological stress ganglions that form in cells where the protein quality control perfectly works. They have no drips, they are very dynamic, and considering that they contain a lot of RNA, if you treat the cells with RNAs A, they are digested. So what you are left with are just the protein component, and it is very small. So you just have few, uh, few dots uh, left. But then when the protein quality control is defective, then you end up with what we call the barren stress granules that are enriched for drips, they are less dynamic, and they are not sensitive anymore to digestion with RNAs because their build-up is now based on protein-protein interaction and therefore they are not digesting with RNAs A. So is there a link between uh, protein misfolding and the presence of mutations in the ALS-linked uh, uh, RNA binding proteins? So we know that uh, cells that have mutations in uh, TDP43, FAS, HRMP1 are characterized by the formation of stress gamma's that are uh, have a lower kinetic. Is this due to the fact that they tend to co-aggregate with TRIPS? So this is another question that we addressed. So we use several models. We use fibroblasts from uh, an ALS patient with the TDP43 mutation. And what we find is that the percentage of drips that is accumulating inside this uh, uh, patient cell is significantly higher compared to the amount of drips that is accumulated in uh, stress analysis form in cells from an LT subject. And these data were confirmed also in fibroblasts from a patient with VCP mutation in to ALS. And then we used HeLa cells that stably express GFP tag fast wild type or the mutant G156E, which is also linked to ALS. And then what we did is that we induced trosganus with MG132. And typically, the trosganus form after three hours. But if you keep treating the cells up to six to eight hours, the trosganus disassemble, because otherwise the cell will die. So in any case, even if the, there is persistent treatment with MG132, after a first wave of formation, there is disassembly of trosganus. Under those conditions, we have accumulation of misfolded proteins because they are not degraded by the proteasome. So we ask, is there a co-aggregation of misfolded proteins and stress gamuts? And actually what we find is yes, because stress gamuts that tend to persist also in normal cells accumulate with time higher amount of drips. So the higher the amount of misfolding proteins that are not taken care, the higher the chance that they co-aggregate with stress gamuts. But this is significantly announced by the presence in cystrous gamuts of this ALS limitation, which make these proteins more prone to aggregation. So we really think that there is a concurrence of uh, failure of the protein quality control and this enhanced uh, aggregation proneness of the uh, RNA binding <coughs> protein linked to ALS. And actually, these data <coughs> have been then uh, further development, developed by other groups. Uh, and this year, the group of Paul Taylor, I think, very nicely demonstrated that indeed the stress gamers can convert and mature into a pathological like aggregate. So, what they did is that they induced a repetitive assembly of stress gamers in size. And what they find is that they evolve into a pathological aggregate that is very similar in terms of composition to the one that we find in the autopsy of the patient, but most likely this is associated with cell toxicity and death. And if you block the formation of this TDP43 uh, enriched uh, stress gamuts, then you also block uh, toxicity. On the other side, of course, ALS is a very complicated disease. It's not all about stress gamuts. So, on top of these contribution of stress gamuts to the formation of these aggregates, it seems that there's also other form of TDP43 that can self-assemble via phase separation into compartments that uh, are not stress gamuts, but they can also mature upon stress uh, into an, a, an aggregated state, so independently of stress gamuts. So I think that somehow these data really uh, tell us that uh, the, the repetitive assembly of stress gamuts, together with the defective clearance of misfolded proteins, may really converge into the evolution of uh, a pathological uh, aggregate, so aggregates that exert toxicity and then uh, accumulate uh, in form of these neural inclusions. So, in any case, these data clearly 
put uh, a link between uh, what the cell is constantly producing as a misfolded substrate and the impact that this misfolded substrate can have on this particular type of memory disorder. Having found so, and considering that cells contain a large variety of membranous compartments, and many of them, as I told you, are found in the nucleus, we ask, do the drips affect only the dynamics of stress ganglions, or can they affect the dynamic behavior of other membranous compartments, and can their mishandling due to protein quality control deficiency contribute to cells of toxicity and uh, neurodegenerative diseases? And as I told you, there is a lot of uh, uh, errors that constantly occur, and they can occur at the level of DNA, as DNA mutation, at the level of the mRNA, and as the, at the level of translation, that will lead to the production of what we call the defective ribosomal products, so proteins that are not able to uh, fulfill their function, and they may exert toxic function because they are aggregation prone. So one striking observation that we made is that when you look at the distribution of drips inside mammalian cells, we found that there was a substantial fraction of drips that was accumulating inside the nucleus. So here we use the cells that uh, express stably gfp tag nucleolin as a marker of the nucleoli, and actually we find that there is a substantial fraction of drips that enters the nucleus and accumulates specifically inside the nucleus. And this is a little bit counterintuitive because, I mean, uh, we think of the nucleus as a compartment that uh, is uh, very well protected by the nuclear envelope, the nuclear pore complex regulates the shuttling of proteins in and out, and having misfolded proteins that are dysfunctional accumulating in the nucleus is kind of why do they go there? So once they are there, if you let the cells to recover in drafty medium, they are cleared and they are cleared in a proteasome-dependent manner. Because if you block proteasome-mediated degradation with MG132, you keep seeing these trips accumulating inside the nucleoli. <coughs> we then substantiated this immunostochemical, uh, this immunofluorescence data, this uh, microscopy data with uh, biochemical fractionation. So we fractionated cytoplasmic proteins, nucleoplasmic proteins, and nucleoli. And as you can see here, Definitely, there is a pool of pyromycelated proteins that accumulates in the nucleus, and especially the pool that accumulates inside the nucleoli is characterized by a very low molecular weight. And this is compatible with small molecular weight protein that can just rapidly diffuse freely into the nucleus through the nuclear pores without being uh, uh, transported actively due to their molecular weight. So we then ask, what is the effect of these drips at the level of the nucleoli, do they affect the functionality of the nucleoli, and do they affect the dynamics of nucleoli, which is another example of a membranous compartment, which has this liquid-like behavior. So concerning the first question, we analyzed the synthesis of ribosomal RNA precursors of mature ribosomal RNA in cells that were treated with opicuro, and we didn't find any significant change to the nucleoli that accumulate these drips can still synthesize ribosomal RNA as efficiently as normal cells. Then we looked at the dynamics by PrEP of two nucleolar proteins. One is a nucleophosmin 1, and the other one is nucleolin. So I'm showing the data about nucleophosmin 1, but the data obtained with nucleolin are very similar. So these are, again, cells that stably express this uh, uh, nucleophosmin protein with the GFP tag. And you can see that the protein is very dynamic in control condition, as well as in nucleoli that accumulates drips. Uh, and even if you block proteasome degradation, increasing the, for the amount of drips that accumulate in the nucleoli, we still do not see under this condition any effect on the mobility of this protein. So these data suggested us that drips are sequestered into nucleolar subcompartments uh, to preserve the functionality of nucleoli. <coughs> And actually, there are two types of nucleolar subcompartments that have been described in the literature by other groups. And one was called the amyloid body, and it was described by the group of uh, Stephen Lee in the USA. And they described the formation of this amyloid body upon heat shock, acidosis, or transcription of stress. And the other uh, subcompartment uh, was called the nucleolar agrosome, 
and was described by the group in Finland of Latonen upon prolonged proteasome inhibition. I mean, 12, 16 hours of proteasome inhibition, then you see aggregated proteins within the nucleus, but uh, in a compartment within the nucleus. So, considering that there is a constant influx of drips inside the nucleus, we ask, do the drips contribute to the formation of the amyloid body, which is characterized by an amyloid-like uh, structure, and uh, uh, the nuclear aggresome. And actually, are these two structures the same structure? So the amyloid body can be visualized using a dye that stain amyloid-like proteins, and it is called amyloglo, and can form simply in cells that are exposed to heat shock. So we took our HeLa cells, we exposed them to heat shock for three hours, and then, as you can see here, you can see that the nuclear light, light up. They become amyloid-like. Under this condition, if you co-stain for drips, there is constant influx of drips inside the nucleoli. And here you can clearly see that they are in different places compared to GFP tag nucleoli. So to address the question whether these drips are responsible for these nuclear amyloidogenesis, we block protein synthesis during the shock. So the cells are exposed to each other, but now during this period we block protein synthesis. And this is sufficient to completely prevent amyloidogenesis. So this means that it is not the pool of proteins that are pre-existing and that the nature and is fold due to the heat, uh, but it's the pool of newly synthesized proteins that is really vulnerable and that is contributing to this nuclear amyloidogenesis. So similar data have been obtained upon uh, proteasome inhibition and upon transcriptional stress and therefore we could generalize our findings and say that yes, A body and nuclear aggresome are actually the same structure that we call nuclear amyloid bodies and actually their formation is dependent on active translation and not on transcription. So what is the fate of these nuclear amyloid bodies? I showed you that the drips are cleared from the nucleoli by the proteasome and then actually they amyloid body that form upon each other or upon prolonged proteasome inhibition are also cleared by the cells in the recovery time. But their clearance requires not only active proteasome, but they require the active participation of the HST70 molecular chaperone, the same one that is required to maintain the liquid-like properties of the Struss granules. Because if you block HSP70 ATPase activity during the recovery phase, then you see that this A body persists for a longer time. So based on this data, we could define a new function for the nucleolide. The nucleolide function as a protein quality control compartment, as a phase separated protein quality control compartment that recruit protein quality control factors and store drips for later clearance. I say later clearance because this occurs in the recovery phase after the stress. So this suggests that conditions that increase the accumulation of misfolded proteins inside nucleoli or that impair the functionality of the protein quality control may promote amyloidogenesis at the level of the nucleoli with potential consequences on the functionality of nucleoli themselves. Because what we did at the beginning with the ribosomal RNA transcription and with the FRAP was done in cells where the protein quality control was still working. So, Actually, there's already indication in the literature that uh, uh, conversion of the nucleolus uh, into, uh, I mean, dysfunction of the nucleoli is linked to neurodegeneration, and then that misfolded proteins that are linked to disease accumulate in nucleolus of compartments. And again, we refer to ALS. So one of the most uh, abundant mutations in uh, ALS and FTP patients is the expansion of the G4C2 repeat in the C9 of 72 genes. And this expansion leads to the formation of RNA that can form RNA for sign the nucleus, but that undergo a process of translation that is atypical and that is called run translation. So by run translation, which is non-ATG dependent, they, these stretches of uh, uh, expanded G4C2 RNA can be transcribed as poly-GR, poly-PR, poly-GA, poly-PA, and poly-GP. And these are dipeptides that are highly aggregation prone. <coughs> And uh, in particular, the poly-GR and the poly-PR, most likely for their highly, uh, high content in positive charges, accumulate inside nuclear subcomponents and they cause nuclear dysfunction. And this has been considered as an important mechanism contributing to ALS. 
So we ask, is now the accumulation of these uh, dipeptide repeats responsible for the amyloidogenesis of the nucleoli? And indeed, if we overexpress GFP10 GR50 in cells without exposing them to stress, we see that the nucleoli convert into an amyloid like state. An accumulation of ribosomal protein RPL23A, which is a normally folded protein, has no impact. So it's not just accumulation of a protein, it's accumulation of a misfolded protein, like the trips inside the nucleoli, that produces this amyloidogenesis. Therefore, this data really suggests that the accumulation of drips due to stress condition, due to in failure of the protein quality control, may concur with the, the accumulation of polyGR and polyPR to promote amyloidogenesis and toxicity at the level of the nucleoli. So while performing our experiments, actually, we found that uh, upon stress condition, Trips were not only accumulating inside these nucleolar subcompartments, but they were also accumulating in foci that uh, were elsewhere in the nucleoplasm. And there are so far two membranous organisms that have been uh, involved in the degradation of proteasome in the proteasome mediated degradation of uh, nuclear proteins, which are the splicing speckles and the PML bodies. And by colocalization studies, we could find that actually drips specifically accumulate at the level of PML bodies upon heat shock and upon proteasome inhibition. So PML bodies, as I told you before, is one another, another, one, another example of membranous organelle that form by phase separation. And in this case, is the interaction of sumo-related uh, PML with sumo-interacting motif that self-assemble into these PML nuclear bodies, and PML act as a scaffold to recruit other sumo-related proteins. So we therefore ask, could it be that the PML bodies act as a scaffold for the sequestration of drips inside the nuclei? So to address that question, we downregulated PML itself, so the regulation of PML decreases, as you can see here, the number of PML bodies, but it's also decreased the number of foci uh, containing drips uh, that form in the nucleus. Then we depleted the UBC9 enzyme that is responsible for the sumoylation of PML, which also disrupt the PML formation, and also in this condition we decrease the number of PML bodies that can form, and we decrease the number of PML body enriched for drips. So really, drips uh, are compartmentalized specifically at the level of PM, PML bodies. Together with uh, drips at the PML bodies upon stress, we also find uh, ubiquitinated, polyubiquitinated proteins. So now we ask the question, what are we looking at? Are the drips themselves that become polyubiquitinated to be degraded at PML bodies? or are pre-existing proteins that just accumulate there and that become polybiquitinated because of the heat shock and because we block their proteasome mediated degradation. And again, if we block protein synthesis with cycloexema during heat shock or during proteasome inhibition, we completely prevent the stress response from occurring, indicating really that it is the pool of newly synthesized the protein in this case, most highly likely drips that becomes ubiquitinated itself at the level of PML bodies. Another important observation that we made is that the pool of drips that is inside the nucleoli is not colocalizing with polyubiquitinated proteins, while the pool of drips that accumulates at drips is heavily colocalizing with polyubiquitinated proteins, indicating that they may fulfill different functions. So they both store these folded proteins, but with different functions. So we substantiated this idea of uh, the pool of drips that PML bodies being polyubiquitinated by QIP. And again here, you can see that uh, we did IP of pure isolated protein from the nucleoplasm and from the isolated nucleoli. And only the pool of polyubiquitinated, pro only the pool of uh, drips that uh, we pull down from the nucleoplasm is polyubiquitinated, perfectly fitting with our macroscopy data. And there, what do we find at PML bodies? We find 20S proteasome, and we find the chaperones HSP70s. These are two uh, form, the cognate form and the uh, stress-inducible form of HSP70, and DCP, which is the chaperone that I told you at the beginning is mutated and associated to LS, and it's required for the degradation of proteins by proteasome and autophagy. 
So these data suggest that we have the old machinery required for protein clearance at PML bodies. So most likely PML bodies act a protein quality control compartment that serve to compartmentalize misfolded proteins in the nucleus to clear them via, via the protosome. And indeed, if we let the cells to recover in drug-free medium after the stress, the percentage of polybutinated proteins compartmentalized at PML bodies decreases and, uh, uh, because they are digested. And they are digested with the help of the HSP70 chaperone and with the uh, VCP chaperone. Because if we block during the recovery phase the ATPase activity of 70 and of VCP, we keep uh, maintain these polybutinated proteins at the PML bodies. So these data allow us to define the PML nuclear bodies as a stress-inducible overflow compartment for DRIPS, and PML nuclear bodies recruit and concentrate protein quality control factors to promote their clearance. And similarly to the conversion of the nucleolus into an amyloid-like state, the accumulation of DRIPS also convert the PML bodies into an amyloid-like state. And uh, FRAP experiments really indicated that there is a decrease in the mobility of PML molecules, a decrease in the mobility of the 20th molecules that are sequestered there. So there is this kind of aberrant transition of a liquid compartment into an aggregated solid-like state, which acquires amyloidogenic <coughs> properties. So failure to clear these drips leads to solidification of PML and sequesters large amount of 20th proteasome, the HSP70 and VCP, which are two important chaperone in the cells. And now we ask the last question. So what is the functional consequence of immobilizing ubiquitin and 20S at the PML? And uh, like we wonder for a long time what is the functional consequence of having the stress gunners that persist for a longer time. I mean, is there a functional consequence? So in the case of uh, uh, sequestration of ubiquitin at the level of the nuclei, we know for sure that ubiquitin in the nucleus is used as a signaling molecule for many pathways. One of these is the DNA damage response. And <clears throat> Mamillian says that a very large genome fail at each replication uh, uh, cycle to uh, replicate portions of the DNA. And these portions of the DNA are labeled by H2A ubiquitinated, which recruits 53 BP1, which shields these portions of the DNA and protect them from DNA damage. And they are generally resolved post-mitotically. So we ask, is there a trade-off between nuclear proteostasis and genome integrity? So do these two processes compete for a limiting pool of ubiquitin? So we see formation of 53BP1 foci in normal growing cells. If we treat the cells with MG132 or MG and opipura, all the polyubiquitin in the nucleus is sequestered there, and we see the disappearance of the 53BP1 foci. In the recovery phase, the polyubiquitinated drips are cleared, and the 53BP1 foci are restored, which is what we see here. We go back to normal. But if during the recovery phase we block the degradation of polyubiquitinated drips by simply inhibiting HSP70, we block the recycling of the ubiquitin, and we can't restore the formation of this 53BP1 foci. So to really demonstrate that it is a matter of the amount of ubiquitin that is uh, uh, limiting, we block protein synthesis during proteasome inhibition, and this was sufficient to restore the 53 bp one foci formation. And during stress condition where we have a lot of polyubiquitinated drips at PML <coughs> bodies, we overexpress HA tag or flag tag ubiquitin, and this was sufficient to restore 52 bp one foci formation. So together, these data really allow us to demonstrate that there is indeed a trade-off between proteostasis and genome integrity. And stress cells are really to balance these two processes to remain healthy and proliferate. And again, what is the functional implication to neurodegenerative diseases of this finding? There is a lot of evidence indicating that accumulation of proteins and aggregation of proteins in the nucleus occurs in neurodegeneration, and this has been also described in ALS and FTD. And they aggregated the level of PML, they sequester ubiquitin and proteasome, which 
is what we find occurring at the level uh, uh, of stress cells. And one of the other mechanisms that is now considered as important driver of ELS is perturbed DNA repair. And uh, cells that have expanded in NR72 that I showed you have also this kind of aminodegenesis occurring at the level of the nucleoli, have also an impaired 52 bp one fossa formation. <laughs> So we ask, could it be that the failure to handle drips and misfolded proteins in the nucleus and the concomitant accumulation of ALS-linked mutated proteins compromise nuclear proteostasis and this in turn affects the ability of the cells to use the limiting pool of ubiquitin for maintenance of genome stability? Is this all linked? So we are now working on this question, of course. So to summarize all what I showed you today, I really showed you that there is a tight cross-talk between the protein quality control and the dynamics of certain membranous organisms that are taking more and more uh, importance in the pathogenesis of ALS, such as transganes, nucleoli, and PML bodies. And I showed you that drips and insulted proteins can accumulate at the level of transganes, converting them into an aberrant state. They can accumulate at the level of nucleoli and PML bodies converting them into an amyloid-like state. And this, if not resolved, can have an impact on the ability of the nucleus to recycle the ubiquitin to maintain genome stability. So with that, we can ask the general question, can we say that cellular aging is linked to a failure of quality control of membranous organisms such as transgranules, nucleoli, and PML nuclear bodies. This is a new way of looking at these problems. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank the people in the lab that did this work. Uh, the work uh, on uh, stress ganus was mainly done by Massimo Ganazzi, Laria Vigi, and also Laura Mediani. All the work at the protein quality control in the nucleus work that was done by Laura Mediani. And all of this was in tight collaboration with Samuel Alberti in Dresden.